Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and continue. Okay. So let's let's start with the audience questions for now. Myself, Pradeepi Sarkar. I'm a PhD student here in IIT. Sadhguru, um, every time we have some uh, submission, me and my friends would plan in advance and uh, we would try to stick to it. But somehow, ultimately it happens that we end up finishing it in the very last minute. So before I used to think like why I wasn't uh, starting it early or why I couldn't finish it early. But then I realized that almost everyone around me is doing the sa uh, same thing and everyone is procrastinating. <laughs> so my question is then, uh, what's the reason? Why do we knowingly procrastinate? See, uh, the longing that you had when you wanted to get into the institute, you have not maintained that longing. Please sit down, sir. You have not maintained that same level of longing. How badly you wanted to get in? If you maintain the same level of longing, you would prepone everything <laughs> that you're doing. Pre Slowly, you slacken up and other things interest you, education sinks down a little bit. If you are doing something that you really want to do, will you prepone or postpone? Will you prepone or postpone? You will prepone. Is that a word? If love is in the air, will you prepone or postpone? Prepone, sure. Prepone. <laughs> so, in a way, Intellectually, knowledge is a love affair, it's really a love affair. If you get involved, it'll become much bigger love affair than emotional love affairs. And I, I, I had to look it up, prepone, I think, I think it says it's a word. Is prepone grammatically correct? I've never heard that word before, <laughs> wow. So, if you conduct your education like a love affair, that you're really involved, then you will always prepone, not postpone. But if you finish too early, that means your faculty is not setting you tight enough time. <laughs> they must set more stringent time, because this is the time of your life where you have to learn how to stretch yourself physically, mentally, in every possible way. Otherwise, life will crack you when you go outside, unless you find a garment job for yourself <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Otherwise, anything else you take up in your life, if you do not know how to physically and mentally stretch yourself without breaking, then life will break you somewhere. So, education time, the time of being youthful is not a leisure time. Unfortunately, you know, in, uh, this may sound like this, a little difficult for you, but you must come and visit and see how it happens. These children came and performed here just now, the calorie, and we have a home school. All these are seven days of the week school. We have planned four to five days in a month as activity days which the children won't know. Someday it will be instead of academics, it will be some other kind of activity. but. Those activity days are more intense than the academic days. When you're growing up, when you're young, you should not be thinking about leisure. Unfortunately, this culture from United States has come, what is that, TG… TGIF? Thank God it's Friday <laughs> So if you're going to enjoy only weekends and weeks you're going to suffer, that means you're doing something that you have no love for. I'm asking, why the hell are you doing it? Why the hell are you doing something that you don't care for? Because it's your life. Your life is just a certain amount of time. If you're doing something that you don't care for, that means you don't even see that your life is precious, isn't it? I'm asking, is your life precious? If it's precious, you must invest it in what truly matters to you. If you invest it in what truly matters to you, you will always prepone, not postpone. You're also TGIF. Namaskaram <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru, I'm Lavanya. Uh, thank you for coming to our campus today. Uh, very Let, exciting. If you can hold it like this, you know. I'm like you know, you've seen Lady Gaga like this. <laughs> ah. Is that good? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm very excited to have you here with us. Uh, my question is, uh, when I was growing as a… when I was growing as a child, 
uh, both my parents were working and there were times I was feeling lonely and very miserable. Although my parents did give their part of comfort to me, the, the, it were, there were times I was feeling lonely in the, in, on the inside. And um, uh, what can our future parents or what can we do to our kids not, to not feel the same way? Thank you. Well, uh, in India, this is the first generation where women have stepped out to work professionally. Otherwise, because we were largely an agricultural community, women worked but in and around the house. And if they went somewhere to the field, they took their children and went. So always like you see ducks and chicken, if the hen goes behind that, the chicks run. Like that, children were always running behind women. So she, she was always doing her work and still managing and tending to them and there was a certain cohesiveness to that. But today women are going to the office or to the factory or to some other business, so they can't take their children there. This is the first generation of women who have stepped out. So in the society, we still don't have arrangements, proper arrangements where children can be properly tended to. That system, that facility and that arrangement has simply not happened in the society yet. I hope it happens quickly because it's very important. It doesn't matter whether it's a biological parent or somebody else, but children need a loving, caring atmosphere. It's very important, just putting nourishment into their stomach is not the only thing. If they need some tending, attending to somebody should smile at them, somebody should laugh at them, somebody should do something with them, play with them. This is very needed, otherwise <coughs> children will grow up a little sick in their head. It is not necessary only a biological mother should do it, but there must be a committed person doing this. It's very, very important for the child. Unfortunately, in this society, we still don't have those arrangements. Okay, uh, I want to put in my little two cents on that one too. I mean, he's not wrong about that for sure, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a child, but also at the same time, you know, you can have gran grandparents or, you know, your your mother and father to help raise a child. At the same time, you, you know, in the United States, that's becoming more and more, they have daycares. But the problem with daycares is that, you know, sometimes they have too much, too many, and it, children are not being taken care of because they just have too many in their hands so yeah someone's watching them but it's not the same because it's not their child so they're not gonna they're gonna make sure that you know they're clean and that they're looked after but not in the same sense as a parent would so that's kind of a tough one you know obviously if you keep it within the family I think that's great because you know there's skin involved <laughs> the, I guess there's because they're family so you want to make sure that your family's taken care of whether they're you know your aunt your uncle taking care of your children or your grandmother or your sister or your brother or whatever it may be because it's all family that generally speaking they'll take special care generally speaking if they're a good family but in terms of like daycare and stuff you you pay them and so long as they're looked after, they don't bang their heads and they're fed, and you know, they wipe their poops, I guess, or peas, you know, it's all good. But you just sit them in front of a TV. <laughs> That's what daycare. I, I don't know, I, I've never taken anyone to daycare, but I know some of them, they can be a little too many. And I'm wondering if now if daycares just have TVs where they sit them in front of the TV just to watch and have nap time and watch TV again, you know. Guru, uh, I want to know that uh, when a student steps into college, uh, all of a sudden he gets, he or she gets access to a huge amount of pornographic material which so far was off limits for him or her. And in the process, he or she enjoys that and as we said, uh, he experiences, he or she experiences heaven on earth. But, uh, and we even have nicknames for those people who overdo it, they masturbate. We overdo it sometimes. So how do we know how much of that is good or bad? And uh, so can we have the truth about masturbation? What a question. <laughs> oh. Is it the soon as they get to college, you all of a sudden just have unlimited access to that? Like, wait, I'm not sure. Maybe because it's different, I'm sure. Maybe 
you know, because colleges, I'm assuming, tends to be in, like, very densely populated areas, which tends to be more developed than, you know, external areas. Um, access to books, I guess, in a library? I don't know. That's kind of weird. But I don't think it's necessarily those types of books, but more of educational, which has that, which can be interpreted as that, if you know what I'm talking about, I guess. It's just such a weird question to ask a guru, but... It looks like a popular question. <laughs> <laughs> See, uh, we have a biology, we cannot put it under the carpet, it's there. It's best we address it for what it is. But right now the problem in the world is because Access. certain religious institutions in the world took this attitude that the very biology of the human being is wrong, because of this, culture started hiding it under the carpet. Mm. Well, in this culture we never had it, but after the British came and left, we became more prudish than the British. But before that, if you look at our temples, mm. uh, all the outside temple art is all pornographic, if that's what you want to call it. But we don't call it pornographic. Yeah. We are only talking about the various dimensions of human biology because we don't see it as wrong, but we see it as the periphery of life. If you stay there only, you will stay on the physical dimension forever, you will not explore anything else. So in the temple, always it's the periphery. You are supposed to look at that and understand it's the periphery of life and try to make an attempt to go deeper, but at the same time not to be in denial of it. Not to glorify it or not to be in denial of it is the most important thing. But in your college, watching these things on the poor, whatever, your internet or whatever, people tell me that uh, somebody told me, I, I don't know if these percentages are correct. AD? When I was asking, what is the content? I was trying to understand the internet and its content. What is the real content on the internet? They're telling me, you should know. They're telling me seventy percent oh. of the content on the internet is pornography. Is it so? I mean, I don't think is so. Is it so? You must be the expert. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't think so. I mean, it could be, but I'm assume uh, my assumption would be like seventy percent is being searched is that, as opposed to seventy percent of the content is that. You know, but I, I don't know. It could be both. <laughs> it might be both. Seventy percent is that, and search for that. <laughs> <laughs> Is somebody doing PhD on it? <laughs> they told me seventy percent. I said seventy percent is unreasonable and sick levels of pornography. If it occupies a small percentage, it's okay. Seventy percent of a technological platform which could do millions of things, unfortunately is pornographic. Just biology of life is very unfortunate because once you come as a human being, your biology is not the front end of your life. It is one part of your life. This cerebral capability came so that your intelligence becomes the front end of your life and if you become conscious, your consciousness becomes the front end of your life. Biology is the front end of uh, a bull. It's okay for him, that's all he knows. But biology should not be the front end of a human life. It is part of our life. We are not denying it. So, at a certain stage in your life, it's like this. A ninety-five-year-old man went for a medical checkup with his doctor. The doctor did a thorough checkup and said, Hey, old boy, you're doing great for ninety-five, no problem with you. Then the old man asked, Doctor, but what about my sex life? Then the doctor looked at him and asked, thinking about it or talking about it? <laughs> so at different stages of life, there are some times you only think about it and talk about it, there are some times you indulge in it. Uh, these are passing phases of life. How much of it is needed for you, you are the best judge. But at the same time, you came here not to explore your biology, 
at least you should have gone to <laughs> uh, MSc in biology. You shouldn't be wasting your time in a technological institute exploring biology. Does it mean to say you don't have biology, you don't have biological needs? You have, it's fine, but it must be on the periphery. It should not become the core of your life because it will reduce you in the sense. A creature which was purely biological evolved into a place which has an intelligence of its own beyond its biology. See, animal intelligence works for its biology alone. How to get its food, how to get its mate, this is all its entire life is. If human intelligence also functions like that, you are bellying the evolutionary process. You are seeing how to go back, take the evolutionary process backward, not necessary. This does not mean you do not have a body, body has its needs as, it, as there is physical hunger, so there is sexuality. You have to address it in some way, but to what extent is your choice, but definitely it should not be the front end of your life because you are rolling back evolutionary scheme of putting your intelligence and consciousness in the front, instead of that you're putting your biology in the front. Well answered, jeez. Uh, it's, a, it's such a uh, very awkward question to ask, you know, um, <laughs> but Sadhguru is really good at answering those. <sighs> what kind of question is that though still? Guru, I've been watching your videos and they've really changed me a lot. So today, sir, uh, Sadhguru, I'm a guitar player and I'm doing engineer, uh, engineering, I'm in second year. So often, like, obviously my Indian parents want me to have a steady life. So they sent me to an engineering college, ki get settled, but they even support me for guitar. But both are getting so hectic for me, like I can't keep my uh, focus on one thing. Like when I'm studying, I think about guitar and all the players and music. And similarly, when I'm playing, I think about other things. And even uh, social circles and all, I don't have a steady mind. And I can't focus uh, at one thing, even if I try a lot. Even mobile is a very big distraction, apparently. <laughs> so, so how do I focus on one thing at a time? Oh, I I fear that if I give too much time to one thing, I might lose or lack uh, in other things. At least in, in the Western world, or how I've learned, is time management. Devote a little bit of time to everything, now, I won't say everything, but the important things in your life. You don't, there's not a lot of time, there's not a lot of time in 24 hours. There's only 24 hours, and about a third of it has to be devoted to sleeping. Some portion of it has to be devoted to the restroom, eating, and getting around. <laughs> <laughs> and then work or something to you know pay your bills so time management I would say at least in terms of the Western world to answer that but I'm kind of curious what Sadhguru would say because um, I would say meditation should help you focus and again again time management taking like an hour as soon as you or wake up an hour early going to sleep an hour early and waking up an hour early to meditate to help try to focus the mind probably see ya. <clears throat> Human mind, do I have a few minutes to answer this question? <laughs> See, the nature of human intelligence is such that it can do many things at the same time as a process. When I say intelligence, most people are misunderstanding intelligence as intellect. Intellect is your thought process. Thought is just one dimension of your intelligence. Thought is only happening because of the data that you have gathered in your mind. You cannot think about anything for which you have no data, isn't it so? Isn't it so? Isn't it so? <laughs> You're getting sleepy? Because usually we put children to sleep at eight. <laughs> So, uh, human intelligence is made like this. We… In, in the yogic way of looking at life, we look at 
human intelligence is sixteen parts. Out of these sixteen parts, we can, for the sake of understanding, we can see it as four segments. These four segments are buddhi, ahankara, manas and chitta. Buddhi means the intellect. Intellect, when it comes to your intellect, would you like your, a sharp intellect or a dull intellect? You must choose, I'm going to bless you right now. Sharp intellect. So obviously, intellect is a cutting instrument. It's like a knife, it's a scalpel. It's good for cutting. If you want to dissect something, you need a good sharp intellect. But suppose you want to sew something, all you have is a knife. If you sew with a knife, you know what will happen? <laughs> <laughs> Poor lady <laughs> You will leave everything in tatters. But right now, this is the way we are going about because our education systems are focused just purely intellectual basis. This is a cutting instrument. If I want to really know you, shall I dissect you? Hello? I want to know you, so shall I dissect you? Well, some of you in your uh, maybe pre-university studies, you dissected a frog and you were very excited how the heart was beating. The frog was not excited, believe me <laughs> It was looking at you, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Yes or no? So, intellect is a certain instrument. It is a cutting instrument. It can be used for certain aspects of life. But unfortunately, we are using it all pervasive because other dimensions of intelligence have not even been touched. The next dimension of intelligence is called identity. The next dimension of the mind is called identity or the ahankara. Identity means Depending upon what you're identified with, that's how your intellect will function. This is a knife in the front, this will always try to protect what you're identified with. You say, I'm a mo woman, it'll try to protect your gender. You say, I'm an Indian, it'll try to protect your nationality. You say, you're some religion, it'll try to protect that. Whatever is your identity, your intellect is always working to protect that identity. So how we establish this identity consciously is a very important part of education which we have completely ignored today, for which we are paying a huge price. In the traditional education, from zero to twelve is balavastha, that means just to play, eat, sleep, so that the body and the brain should grow till they are twelve years of age. You should not try to teach anything, extract anything. From twelve to twenty-four is focused learning. This is called as brahmacharya, discipline of how to learn. Learn is not just learning other disciplines, but above all, learning about the nature of my own human mechanism, my intelligence, my different faculties, how they function, because if I don't understand this, I cannot really apply myself into anything. So. We always establish this, you might have heard of this, there is something called as Aham Brahmasmi at the age of twelve. This is taught to a child before we initiate a child into education. First he must take a universal identity that my identity is the larger universe. Maybe today I'm an Indian, maybe today I belong to this religion or that religion, maybe I belong to this caste, clan or whatever. But my large, larger identity is with the universe because education was seen as an empowerment. We don't want to empower you when your identity is narrow because all the crime on the planet, all the corruption on the planet, all the horrendous things that people to do to each other is only because of limited identity, isn't it? You know, that's a very interesting statement. Um, I know I've heard Sadhguru explain certain portions of this talk prior. It's something that he repeats in a lot of his talks. Um, I don't remember him talking about the crime being just a narrow identity. I'm sure he has, but somehow it didn't stick to me because I think um, a few months ago, within this year or last year, again, I, I, don't, I don't hate people easily, but I think I've... I think I've recently actually i've said it in the video before but i i see us as humans first 
before I see your your sub identities, and that's what makes it, I guess, how even if I don't agree with whoever's in charge of whatever it may be, your job, the country, your state, local whatever police or whatever it may be, or you're even in charge of whatever your local group is, I see them as a human first, and I can I can sympathize with them. And I can disagree with them at the same time. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I can disagree with them at the same time. So, and I want to make this video, but about Sadhguru and Acharya Prashant, about people talking about one's fake or the other's fake or whatever, but I I want to make that video because I just want to want to get things straight. Um, it, I mean, it doesn't come up too often, but, you know, if you if you love Acharya Prashant, there's nothing wrong with that. If you love Sadhguru, there's nothing wrong with that. But hating on someone else, I think that's a bit much. You can disagree with them. Sure, absolutely. That's perfectly fine. Uh, do I agree with everything, Sadhguru? Uh, I know I agree with a lot. I don't know. I don't remember if there's anything I disagree with, with either Sadhguru or Acharya. Most of the time, it's just me not quite understanding what they mean, because obviously I'm watching a video, and I can't ask them a question and say, what do you mean by this? <laughs> but anyways, me looking at people as human beings first, um, I think it's a, de a definitely a good perspective, and and whenever Sadhguru talks about that, all the bad things are by our limited identities, and it seems very much so. As I think about whenever he said I, I thought about the different kinds of crimes and stuff. Well, don't get me wrong, there's still more to it of the bad things that are happening in the world, but that is at least one portion of what's wrong. I can do it to you, but I can't do it to myself because this is me. Isn't it? I can't do it to my own child, but I can do it to somebody else because this is mine and that is not mine. So before you are empowered with education, which we seen as a powerful tool for life, first thing is take a universal identity. Unfortunately, we've neglected because of this. Today, if you see, the cutting edge of technology and science always goes first for military use. Yes or no? I'd say no, but don't get me wrong, a lot of things were discovered because of the military. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of countries want to value their security of their people first, of their country. And, um, and uh, sadly enough, that's where funding gets. And the good thing about it is that it kind of spills over into the civilian life. A lot of things that were developed for the military now develop are developed for the people. The World Wide Web was developed for the military. And guess what? Now it's most, I won't say mostly, but it's for us now, for everyone. And I'll say, not necessarily just for the military, not anymore. I mean, I would say probably earlier on, but I think nowadays it's, it's very pro probable that, you know, big businesses will develop something so that they can sell to the consumers and not necessarily to the military. Because there's probably more money in consumers than military. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. So how to kill people, how to dominate somebody, how to destroy somebody, this is where our knowledge is going simply because we did not establish a universal identity before education came to people. So the third dimension of your mind is referred to as manas. Manas means it's a silo of memory. When I say memory, it's not just what you remember, your entire body is memory. There is evolutionary memory here, there is genetic memory here, there is karmic memory here, there is articulate and inarticulate levels of memory, conscious and unconscious levels of memory, various dimensions of memory, we identify eight different forms of memory. Right now, you may not remember how your great-great-great-grandfather looked like ten generations ago, but his nose is sitting on your face. Body remembers, yes or no? Body absolutely remembers everything. So this memory is the basis of your intellect. If we take away the memory or delink the memory from your intellect, your in intellect will become without activity. This is one important dimension of yoga that we understood that if we... See, if you want to continue the knife analogy, the intellect is like a knife. The hand that holds the knife is identity. 
knife is useful or dangerous depending upon not on the knife's quality but the hand which holds it, isn't it? If you're identified one way, this knife will poke you. <laughs> if you're identified in a different way, this knife can save your life. So the same knife every day saves lives and sometimes takes lives depending upon who holds it or which hand holds it. So we dealing the menace with the intellect. Now intellect simply there without intention. So essentially yoga means this, to build an intensity within you without intent. Right now, I want to become an engineer, I want to become rich, I want to make money, I want to be this, I want to be that, you become goal-oriented. This is the fundamental flaw in the education system, we become goal-oriented. Because we want to get there, we are doing all this, we are like circus monkeys. <laughs> circus monkeys are like this, you show a banana and say, you do all those tricks, I'll give you a banana. So it will do all the tricks, mm -hmm. banana. No banana, you will simply sit there. So, once you become human, you should not behave like a circus monkey. It is not because of a carrot and stick that you're driving yourself, because you're seeing that what you're doing is of some consequence to you and to the world around you. That's why the action. So if you de-link the knife and the hand and the silo of memory, then your intellect will shine with sharpness. It will not be rusted with memory. It will shine with sharpness. See, it's like this. There are uh, some people who are... <laughs> when you go to restaurants, you will see and maybe in some homes also. You ask them to cut a mango, uh, they will use the same knife with which they've cut onion and they cut the mango and give you. You can't keep it in your mouth, the sweetness of the mango is gone. If the residual impact of whatever the, in the knife has touched is there in it, slowly it will lose its purpose, isn't it? The same goes for your intellect. If the memory sticks to your intellect after some time, it will become a useless intellect because it becomes a highly prejudiced intellect. So the entire yogic system is about this, to dissolve your identity and simply sit here so that your intellect will shine like a razor without any intent, intensity without intent, if it comes into your intellect you can do twenty-five things at the same time, just like that, okay? In this... this last portion, I, I was gonna pause it, but I figured I'd let him finish, just in case. But is he... was he trying to say a disconnect between your intent and what you're going to do? So for example, the example give about like the monkey holding the banana, we're doing these things because we expect a reward, we work because we expect a pay, we go to school because we expect a scholarship, a scholar, not scholarship but a, a, a diploma or a PhD or, you know, whatever it may be, a piece of paper that says we accomplish it, otherwise we wouldn't be going to school without this piece of paper. No piece of paper, no going to school, no pay for the job, not going to the job. And it almost sounds like he said, he was saying here too, that's the reason why we're, we're in I was not say rewarded, but enticed. Um, we're driven because we expect a payoff, a pay, whether it be the the paperwork for your PhD, whether it be a uh, check, a paper for your money. <laughs> but instead, to do it because with do to do it without pay, not necessarily not literally without pay, but to do it without expecting something. Obviously, you still should get paid, but you shouldn't be doing it because of the pay. You should be doing it because you need to do it, and pay is just as a result of the action that you do. So a disconnect between what you're doing and your expectation of it, I suppose. can't say the right words. It's not formulating right. But anyway, do something without expectation. But obviously... Like, for him, he's traveling, he's studying, and he wants to, he's thinking about guitar because he wants this payoff. Although I don't know if that's necessarily his struggle, but but instead he should focus on this on what he needs to get done. I don't know how to I don't know how that answers his question though. To me it sounds like he's just having a time management issue. If he can focus one or two hours into his to his school and then an hour to his 
you know, guitar. That way he's he's making time for things that he want and he can kind of look forward to it. But focus on what he's doing now and put a time frame. It's like, okay, two hours from now, I'm going to do the guitar. Start and just focus on your... So that way you can focus on your thing and you know that when your alarm goes off, you can focus on your job. But anyways, with Sadhguru's explanation here, I thought it's like there's a disconnect, a disconnect between what you're doing and the reward. That way you can focus on what you're doing, that you need to do what you need to do without seeing the reward. The reward should just come obviously, but you shouldn't be expecting it while you're doing the work, I think. People keep asking me, Sadhguru, you, you have been busy the whole six months, not a day's break, then how did you write this poem? How did you think about this? How did you come up this plan? How did you design this one and that one? I have twelve, fourteen tracks running all the time, I just initiate and leave, they will run by themselves. See, when a computer is able to process something, if you feed and leave, it processes, isn't it? Isn't this a better computer than anything that you have ever used? Hello? Only problem is you did not read the user's manual for this one. You must read the user's manual <laughs> So just listening to videos is no good, we can teach you a simple practice. You start the practice of delinking the intellect from the memory at least for a few minutes a day, you will see your intellect becomes super competent. I want to ask you that, uh, what is logic and, and why it, and why it uh, looks as logical? Means, because uh, whenever I start thinking, means it seems that yeah, yeah, means this is logical and this is logical. But when I do the uh, maths, so there is a uh, ambiguity. So, so if uh, it is logical, then why it is not coming to the math? Or the second question is uh, how to express means of myself. Uh, the feeling which I have don't have words. So how to 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 create? means the words for my feeling that, yeah, means what I actually feel and means how to understand the others, that what is going on in me. Oh, wow. Um, uh, it's, I'd say there are small ways to express yourself than just words. Art is a form of expression, singing is a form of expression. If you, but uh, obviously, art is interpreted can be art. Art can be interpreted in many different ways, and it's very difficult to express. Kinda, some people can understand it, but you know, people when you see art, can you see what the person is expressing on there? Sometimes, me probably not. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's you, there's five different avenues of expression instead of uh, words. Singing, a bit different than words, but could be art. Um, I don't know what, uh, what other forms are out there, but let's see what Sadhguru says. Okay, that, that's it. Uh, <clears throat> see whether somebody else understands what's happening within me or not is not the issue. Whether I perceive what's happening within me or not is the main issue. Whether this person understands me or not is his problem. The question is, what's happening within me, is it clear to me? This is the important thing, if it's clear to me, whether I find words for it or not, doesn't matter. About logical and illo illogical and the mathematic, even the mathematics is only logical to a certain point. That is why they came up with uh, calculus, it's quite illogical. <laughs> Yes or no? <laughs> so because they want to explore dimensions of existence which don't all fall into simple logic, that is why we came up with mathematics or the type of mathematics that we are doing right now, which is not really logically correct, but it articulates certain aspects of the existence. So instead of worrying about what is logical, what is illogical, life is absolutely logical. Material is logical. 
So only handling material aspects of life, we have to be perfectly logical. When it comes to other dimensions of life, it's not logical. And in fact, all the most beautiful aspects of your life are not logical. If you… if you uh, try to logically find expression to every dimension of your life, you will feel silly. Suppose you fall in love with somebody and you write it in prose, you will look stupid. But you write in poetry, suddenly it's beautiful because poetry allows illogical expression. Prose does not allow logical… Uh, illogical expression. So you cannot do illogic in arithmetic or geometry, but trigonometry is there, <laughs> illogically. <laughs> So, in every sphere of life, people have understood that logic has its limits and they have found why ways to explore life through means which are not necessarily hundred percent logical. Your logic… your logic fits into this life perfectly well, but don't try to fit the life into logic, it doesn't fit. Thanks for um, giving me this opportunity. I want to ask that uh, when we are roaming on the street, uh, even the dog also not happy and we are also not happy. Please hold this a uh, little closer to you, yeah. Uh, it's quite safe. Mother Nature gives us a brain, but we are responsible for everything, to take care of plants, birds, but we are not taking care, even we are not happy for ourselves and not we are ca ha keeping happy to the Mother Nature. So, what we have done for our life means it's our responsibility, Mother Nature give to a responsibility to a human, to us, to take care of everything. But we are not taking care and not even we are happy. Okay. Thank you. Um, very odd question. I, I don't think necessarily Mother Nature has put us on this planet to take care of it. I, I, I do believe that we all, all of us kind of has responsibility because of our intellect. Intellect or intelligence? I don't remember which one Sadhguru talks about. Not the one that Sadhguru is talking about though. <laughs> intelligence? Anyways, um, we are animals too. I mean, you know, animals will eat other animals to extinction and then them, they themselves will become extinct as well. So it's not like animals are conscious in terms of the decision they make. It tends to balance out, you know, obviously for some degrees, but then, you know, you have meteorites that wipe out, you know, <laughs> entire <laughs> what, phases of the earth. I don't know what to, I don't know what to call it. I forgot what to call it. But, you know, like I think that the science says like 99% of... All, all creatures that exist on Earth are extinct. <laughs> so, obviously, there will always be a course correction. Um, so it's, it's really weird to say that we are, we are put here to take care of nature. Now, obviously, we can make whatever, however we choose to live our life has an impact on this Earth. And how we impact this Earth will also affect us. I can I can believe in that absolutely. If we if we, you know, if we burn so much carbon fuels and just you know build up the cloud of uh, what I forget what it's I don't know if it's carbon monoxide or dioxide or monoxide monoxide, and we make global warming because we're so responsible, and we speed up global warming because of our responsibility of it, then yeah we're gonna we're gonna suffer for it because of what we did. But generally speaking, I think in terms of if we didn't have all this technology and stuff, I, our only purpose in this life is to survive. If we go back to the animal um, mentality of just eat, sleep, drink, and reproduce. But because of our intellect, we are a bit beyond that. And to say that we have some responsibility, we have responsibility in terms of the actions that we take, absolutely. Uh, I don't know where you saw an unhappy dog. It must be a Mumbai dog. <laughs> <laughs> Huh? Must be a Mumbai street dog where uh, <laughs> too many vehicles and things are moving around, poor guy is just surviving day to day. Otherwise, dogs are happy if their stomach is full. They're really very happy. Go in the villages and small towns and see, they're just romping around happily. 
as long as they're well-fed, they're happy. So human beings also, not that everybody is unhappy, there are happy people and unhappy people, they always were, still are. We are seeing how to increase the percentage of happy people so that we can live in a joyful world. It's out of my greed that I'm incessantly active in the world because I want to live in a joyful world. But a lot of people are <laughs> looking like carrying an end-of-the-world expression on their face, <laughs> as if the world is going to end today. Especially if the world is going to end today, it's time to be joyful, isn't it <laughs> So, we are living irresponsibly for sure, for various reasons we are like this. For us in this country, we… we have an enormous culture, enormous. No nation on the planet has twelve, fifteen thousand years of history and culture. This culture we can use to become wise and wonderful, but a whole lot of people use it in a different way. <laughs> because you said everybody's unhappy, I thought I'll tell you a joke. You okay? It once happened, the, Iraq, the Iraqi ambassador to India okay. met Shankaran Pillai. <laughs> when people of two ancient cultures meet, it's bullshit time, <laughs> always. How our culture, you know, because we've got nothing much to show in the present, we po talk a lot about the past. Well, we can be proud about our past, but we can't live there. We are proud about the past history of this nation, the culture of this nation, but you cannot live there, you can only live here. But this is the usual thing. So the Mesopotamian culture, big. So the Iraqi ambassador started off and he said, our culture is so great that we have excavated sites in Iraq where the site is over twenty-five-hundred years ago, two-thousand-five-hundred-year-old sites and we found copper wires. It proves that we had telegraph two-thousand-five-hundred years ago. Shankaran with the ha, that is nothing. We have excavated sites which are five to seven thousand years old and we found nothing. That means we had wireless <laughs> Because we are engaged in debates like this, we are not taking care of many immediate things that we need to take care of, how to keep our street clean, how to keep our city clean, how to see that everybody is fed well, you know. We are not taking care of this because we are a little in the wireless state. <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> So being in a premier technological institute like this, which uh, hundreds of thousand students want to get into this institution and barely a couple of hundred or three or four hundred people are getting in, is it? Yes. So, uh, getting into a coated place like that, uh, where even internationally the institution is recognized as one of the premier institutions, it's not just in India. So when you're in a place like this, it's my wish and my blessing that uh, you must really acquire knowledge and knowledge is no good unless it is dispensed with love and compassion in the world. Just pure knowledge without love and compassion, without involvement in life around us can become a very cruel force. Technology is the best thing that's happened to us and the worst thing that's ever happened to us, unfortunately. You have to make sure that technology is the best thing that's happened to us in the coming generation. The previous generations, all of us have used technology in a negative way. Yes, we've made bombs, we've made pollution, we've made terrible things. It's for you to create a wonderful world with the knowledge that you're garnering here. Being here in this premier institution, do not forget, so many would like to be here, but you are here. Please make use of this and create something really fabulous for this world. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's not really too much to say uh, towards the end there, I mean, 
Siguru at IIT Bombay, Youth and Truth. I mean, there are a few different questions there, and oddly enough, there's been a few, been one random odd question. <laughs> And it's the kind of questions like that that's quite interesting, I will say, sometimes, sometimes, you know, might as well throw in a little bit of odd ones with uh, with some informative ones in there. And um, and the new thing that I, I, dis I guess you could say I discovered in, in this, inter in at least this particular video, was the, because um, I don't remember, I don't remember him saying it in that particular way in the older videos about how Many of the world, many of the world's problems are these little tiny identities. I know he says many of the world problems. Well, maybe he did, and for some odd reason, it just stuck out to me this time. I think maybe because I, a few months up to a year ago, I just started started seeing more people as human beings, more so. And that quote he said finally really stuck to me. Hmm. Maybe that maybe that's the reason why. And that's the thing though, you know, as you as you as you grow up you become wiser, you learn things. And going back and watching some of these videos, you, you start to realize the words hit a little bit differently. The sentences hit a little bit differently. They have more meaning now because of the things you've experienced in life. You begin to see perhaps maybe some of the things you didn't see the first time you watched the video because you didn't see it that way. You never experienced what he what he just said, and now that you have, it's it's just different. It has more meaning. It's more impactful. You remember it. You follow it now. So this is the reason why I kind of like going through all this youth and truth talk is because again sometimes they have some interesting questions that I've never thought about, or maybe sometimes the guru answers the same question a little bit differently. So anyways, that's my reaction to said guru at IIT Bombay. If you like my content, please consider subscribing, thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next vid.